Greetings. My name is Kamatu Kalfani, and welcome to the Sound Gatherer Special. This is really a special. We've got an extremely special guest with us today. It was very difficult to get him to sit still for a moment, but let me introduce you to our special guest, Mr. Anthony Sloan. Mo, how are you? I'm well. Welcome, Anthony. Um, I'm happy to be here, or actually any place on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we, this is we, we're going to demonstrate a very, very serious technique today. We are going to dissect Anthony Sloan. Uh, I know that's a difficult proposition for a number of reasons, but let me start at the beginning. And we want to hit some biographical material, but you have done so much. I don't know if we have enough tape to lay out the things that you have done. But let me go someplace that I wanted to go since I've uh, actually met you here at WBAI. Where did your artistic career first uh, meet that, you know, that confluence of forces in the universe when something happens and you know this is it? What was that for you and what was your first paying job in the arts world? Uh, it's, uh, actually, it's a rather easy, easy kind of thing. A, a lot of people, you know, have problems with that. It was very easy. I was 16 years old, and I uh, had just uh, made my uh, fraternity, Pennis Grill, at the time it was called Pennis Grill Military Fraternity, but Pennis Grill Fraternity out of the New York Submission Society Cadet Corps. Anyway, um, I had just made my fraternity. I was walking along um, uh, close to FDR Drive, actually, uh, in, down, down the Lower East Side, and I met one of my fraternity brothers, mm -hmm. uh, Charles Green. And we, this was like a, uh, this was like early, uh, this was like early uh, 1967, and uh, and 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 Charles said he says he said Anthony you know I, there's this new theater company that's, mm -hmm. that's opening up called the Negro Ensemble Company and I'm one of the people in it but this would be great for you you know you should you know you should contact them and uh, and and tell them that you're interested mm -hmm. in this thing now. The reason why I said that because on, on our line that we made the third line of Pennis Grove Military Fraternity, there was only five of us who made it, which is I, I can't, I won't go into all that, but it was we call a rat patrol, and I was what's called the soul preacher of the line, which basically <laughs> the soul preacher, the soul preacher. We, you have a parliamentary, well, you have a, a chaplain for the line, parliament. We, all of our four, so there's only five of us. We, all our offices were, were done, like the president, vice president, the treasurer, uh, the, the, the 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 chaplain, which was me, and uh, and the. I think the parliamentarian. Now, now, is this the first paying job, or is this the flashpoint? This is a flashpoint because what, you have to understand. I, I, I'm born and raised in the South Bronx, in New mm -hmm. York City, Patterson Projects, on the 41st Street and Morris mm -hmm. Avenue, and so I'm a ghetto kid. I mean, for real, project, projects kid, if you want to call it, whatever you want to call it. And but I was sort of unusual in my project because I would travel all the way, all around the city, and because mm -hmm. of the cadet corps, I did that. So when this, when Charles told me about this. Um, I wrote a letter. Now, you have to understand, it's very unusual for a ghetto kid to actually write a letter. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a letter to the Negro Ensemble Company, the address he gave me. And I got a letter back from Ron Mack. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, you know, he says, well, we're not having any classes. You know, with, well, no classes are opening, but as soon as it comes about, we'll, we'll, we'll contact you. And lo and behold, at the end of the summer, they did contact me. So um, basically, at the end of 1967, about November, they started the intermediate acting class. So this is just a class. But because of there were certain things happening at the time, and because for some reason, uh, while class, we had to do this presentation all the time. So mm -hmm. one of the um, girls, because we're all young girls in the class, she wrote a play that was going to be our presentation for our class. And, she, and because of, for, people always want to put me in front of the camera, in front of stage, or whatever have you. Because of that, I became the, the title character for her, the play that she wrote called The Last Dragon, holds this mm -hmm. fable about this dragon that they capture, and it's the whole, right, uh, right. You know, uh, what we call a colonialist kind of thing. So anyway, so we go through that, and uh, and it was a success and whatever have you, but then they, Negro Ensemble, because we were trained to do everything in theater, mm -hmm. you know, set, does, does everything, sets, lights, you know, painting, everything. Very everything nice, well-rounded. Yeah. Uh, you know, dance, uh, Lewis Johnson was our dance instructor, all, all, all these kinds of things. Um, but they had a production, uh, f they was doing a production called Daddy Goodness. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, for some reason, they wanted me to, to run the lights for Daddy Goodness. So that's my actually first paying job in theater, if you want to. Mm. So I both know. of them happened in the same place. Yeah, exactly. Wow, that's pretty cool. But let me ask you something else, too. You said things were going on. This is 1967. Mm. 
What was the backdrop in the community and around the country in 1967? What was happening? Well, the Daddy Goodness I started working on in, 19, in the summer of 1968. So I had just graduated high school in basically May of 68. Mm -hmm. So this is the time of basically, you know, upheaval, you know, uh, urban, they call it urban upheaval, but upheaval worldwide. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is when, you know, the French threw a cinema thing. Mm -hmm. They started to protest, and that went to, that, that was on a university campus, and then the Mexico University. And then all of a sudden, you get, you know, basically Yale and Columbia, all mm -hmm. those schools being taken over. And, of course, my school that I was going to at the time, Bronx Community College, we took over that mm -hmm. also. I happen to have been into what was called a, um, a revolutionary cell. It was very unusual at the time. I had a very unusual like uh, thing. Our cell was, um, was um, it was three men, three women. And this is unusual at the time because we were all equal. The women weren't getting coffee and stuff like that or mm -hmm. running the steno machine or something like that. We were all mm -hmm. studying. You know, we studied like Nkrumah and, 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 mm -hmm. and Mao and, and, and Fanon and Che, you know, all the... the so you had, you had a sense of what was going on around the world and not just where you were. Yeah, because we, was, we were serious. We were serious. I mean, we mm -hmm. were serious. We, we actually thought we were going to overthrow the country. I mean, it's not a... <laughs> was it wasn't there, a hypothetical. There, there, no, there's, there's people in jail right now that still... That that mm -hmm. are in jail because they really and and well it was serious and I I think personally I think actually the, the, the I, Hoover and them they they had every right to be like paranoid because mm -hmm. like we were serious mm -hmm. you know it was, it was a, a real war because and justly so so anyway so that stuff was happening I was ne at Negro Ensemble Company but I always had a balance you know what I mean I mm -hmm. did community because I grew up in the cadet corps you know so like from nine years old I've mm -hmm. been teaching you know so the, in fact that the, the next year in 1969 I did my first play with the kids and stuff right. like that as far as that but you know, so I've always had this thing about politics you know versus culture in mm -hmm. fact right now I describe myself as, a, as basically a cultural revolutionary a self-described cultural revolutionary mm -hmm. Um, I mean, at the time, but they, they had the Harlem State Office Building just being built. You know, the big hole. I remember, I'm up there, in a, in a, a can't, you know, the fire ruining the can't keep yourself warm. Me and maybe five other people protesting. We had to stop the construction of this. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's weird because, you know, my sort of stripes and if you want to call it urban upheaval or, or protest or whatever, have is very, very long. I've always been involved. I mean, I mean, all this stuff was happening. I can't even explain all this. When I was in high school, you know, we walked out. We had all the high schools went. This was in 60, the end of 68. All the high schools walked out to, we, we were in the Bronx. I went to Bronx. Mm -hmm. I went to um, uh, Theodore Roosevelt High School across okay. from um, across from Fordham University. In fact, that's when I saw the original Last Poets because mm -hmm. they were playing across the street at one time. But we all walked out one time, protest. All the Bronx schools uh, all met at uh, Bronx High School of Science in a protest, you know, against mm -hmm. the war and, and all the rest of that stuff. So this whole kind of backdrop, so I've always been this thing between, you know, culture and mm -hmm. uh, culture and, and politics, let's put it that way. Well, now, where did that develop? Because, obviously, um, some people have asserted that you may have come here from another planet, but obviously you, you wound up in some delivery room <laughs> somewhere and you had an upbringing. What kind of influence and backdrop was the family life in, in the development of this stuff? No, it's... Um, see, I was raised by... Uh, I was raised by my grandmother, and, mm -hmm. and uh, in, in, like I say, the Patterson Projects, uh, 340 Morris Avenue. And, um, but I was, born, I was born, actually I was born in Morrisina Hospital, which is no longer a hospital, it's a clinic now in Morrisina section of the Bronx. I grew up in, this, in basically the Mott Haven section of the mm -hmm. Bronx. And uh, there was no particular, you know, politics involved. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just a sense of uh, justice. Mm. Or, or, or against injustice. So my whole orientation is that if I see something wrong, you know what I mean, it's just, I mean, someone wouldn't ask me what makes you angry. The only thing that actually makes me angry is injustice. Well, you know, that is, uh, that is a real serious piece of irony. I'm going to explain why that's an irony later on. But that energy, that force, that power that you are surrounded with and a part of how do you juxtapose that against what you see today? How did you? How did this society that was so passionate and entrenched get from that to where we are today? Uh, this is a, 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 a believe it or not, Kamau. Uh, uh, I, I, I I've been thinking about this a, a lot, not lately, but but for a long time, and I really think it has to do when we were growing up. 
And I'm assuming that we're about the same, you know, the, the same generation. Well, I just turned 12 the other day. Okay, I got you. <laughs> so you have, you, have, you have to understand how we how we do this. Once person once told me nobody gets beyond nine years old, <laughs> which basically means you know. You know, you, you you might say you're 12, but that probably means that that that, that you you're, you're probably how, how we say like 66. You know what I mean? <laughs> six and six is 12. And then, oh, gotcha. yeah. But anyway, um, when I was growing up, it, it was always like the value of education, mm -hmm. right? That was one thing. But then somewhere in there, they would also say, oh, you don't understand the value of money. You know, you got to have money. Mm -hmm. At some place in the, I'd say the late 60s, early 70s, right around the time of, of maybe Nixon's second term, mm -hmm. when the, the rent started to go up, mm -hmm. disproportionate to what you had to make, money became more valuable. At the same time, remember, we just started having TV in the late 50s, so no more, we didn't really didn't grow up on TV, we really grew up more, more on books and, and, and mm -hmm. playing with your with, with, your, with your group, you know what I mean, with, with your mm -hmm. age group and stuff like that. It wasn't really until the 70s, the mid-70s, we even had music more, you know, radio music mm -hmm. more. But really, it wasn't until the, the, the destruction of the, of the album, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It wasn't really until the TV really take, take over. So you get this whole thing where the, the image is important to you, where what's important to you is what's the consumerism is important to you. And so what happens, I believe, is that you become, for lack of a better term, just to use a word, you become greedy. Mm. Greedy for, for what, not that you don't have, but greedy for what you think you should have because you've been inundated with what you think is due you, entitlement, because it, it, it's on that box, you should be able to... So, so somebody box. else has actually fed you your menu... Is that the point that you make? Yeah, I mean, your, your, your desires. They've, 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 in, uh, uh, they've, they've infiltrated your, 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 your desires, your real desires. So if, instead of being passionate about the liberation of your people, you're more passionate about getting, getting that new sneaker mm -hmm. or, the, or those particular clothes. Instead of making, learn, instead of doing the Gandhi thing and weaving your own you know your fabric and making your own suit, you know what I mean? Right, right. You, you, you're going to get the suit that the, the Italian guy get, the, the, the Italians mm -hmm. make. Now, people don't know the real rich people, what they do is they go to Milan, I've been to Milan. They go to Milan, get the fabric, go to Hong Kong, get it sewed up in the suit that they want, mm -hmm. you know, and then you, now voila. You, you talk yeah. about images, and then you threw in there that you've been to Milan, but you've been to a lot of places. You've traveled extensively. Yeah, with no money. <laughs> yeah, which is even greater a greater miracle because <laughs> I think that you come out of a genre and a generation that understood the value. You were t talking earlier about the monk journey, <laughs> you know, that understood the value of making a trek like that and what it does developmentally to a human being. H how many places, off the top of your head, how many countries would you say you've been to? How many cities would you say that you've been to, including no. cities in the United States? No, man. I, I, uh, at some point, in 1973, when I was in the, uh, in 1973, I made a decision. I was in the Air Force at the time, and I made a decision to, uh, I had a choice of either going to California or going to, I believe it was Ethiopia at mm -hmm. the time. A simple decision, go to Ethiopia, right? <laughs> and I said, no, I've, something in me said, if I leave this country, I will keep on traveling. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to go to California and experience the United States mm -hmm. first. So it took me like whatever. I didn't really start leaving until, until 89. So it took me from 73 to 89 to finally mm -hmm. leave, the, leave the country. So I experienced a lot of cities in, in, in the United States, a lot of travel in the United States, but not, not a whole lot. You know, and my first trip out of the United States really to Canada, to Montreal, one of my favorite cities on mm -hmm. the planet, Montreal. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I've been to Panama, and then, then, then I took this trip in, in 89. It's a seminal trip. I was actually working at WBAI, mm -hmm. and I just got the job as a production engineer for BAI. And this is funny because, um, and I had scheduled this trip, and they gave me this position, you know. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I'm going to take a two months, I'm going to be gone for two months, and I'll be back, you know, to, you know, to start the job. Mm -hmm. And so, I went to Guatemala, it was the time, and I wanted to get to, I wanted to get to Nicaragua. And Bluefields, Nicaragua had been, we had been doing, I, my, my program, No More Radio, mm -hmm. was on the air. And we had had this uh, cities, this sister cities project with Bluefields, Nicaragua, where once a month we did this poetry thing. 
and then mm -hmm. we send the poetry program that we did, the normal radio we did for that month, down to Bluefields, Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. So they were broadcasting, you know, mm -hmm. this is the old time when you send a cassette tape. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they were broadcasting. So I wanted to get down to Bluefields, and this was the time of the elections or whatever have you. And I, it didn't work out. Anyway, I was in Guatemala, and then I said, well, let me go to Belize, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up going to Belize, and I, I'm just spending, instead of two months, I ended up spending like four months, you know, in the jungles of Belize, just with the people. I did this whole thing up and down for the to, to southern part of Belize to the Garifuna people from, from basically mm -hmm. Belize City to the Dangri, well, Stan Creek, they call it, um, same by uh, Georgetown, the inner city, uh, uh, in, uh, in interior city. Most of these Belizeans or or, or, or say Garifuna people are, are, are fishermen, people except for mm -hmm. Georgetown, which is a farming kind of community, down to Punta Gorda, down to my favorite place on the planet, Barranco, Belize. Mm -hmm. Even Belizeans don't know about Barranco, Belize. And this is where I saw a, a, a condor in the wild. You know, mm -hmm. I had this fast, fascinating thing of walking these butterflies, thousands of butterflies, you know, surrounding me. I usually travel by myself. This is this, this, all these kind of things. But that was my first trip for four months. But I wrote them like, I wrote back <laughs> about the middle of this. Uh, I think I'll be here a little bit longer, you know. So and you still have a job when you come back. Well, you know. I was, for some reason, I'm, I'm sort of competent in certain things. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, I'm really good at certain things. I mean, mm -hmm. I know theater and radio. It's basically what I know. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm really competent in certain certain things, really, like engineering, you know, and, and, and working. But it's like I can talk to engineers, but I also can produce, you know, and, and interview. And right. it's one of the things. So, so my, and and I and I can edit real well. So you know, I don't know. It's BAI. You know, who's going to fire me? Uh, how, you know. how did you begin your tenure at BAI? I was a telephone volunteer. I was listening to Emanations. Uh, it was in Emanations with Bernard White, and he his, the way the style of his program was closer to what I did in in in, uh, in college. I had a college mm -hmm. radio program called Variations in Blackness. Mm -hmm. And I actually started in radio in '73 at uh, WPRB in Princeton. I was a poet in residence for a program called Saturday Soul, a six and hour, six and a half hour program on a Saturday. And I would just I would do one poem, but I would sit there and watch the DJ JB. I just watch him for six hours, mm -hmm. watch him run the board and marvel at how he would do, did the music. It was a soul program, but when he came to my poem, we would, there was that time of that kind of jazz fusion mm -hmm. thing. So my poem always had a jazz fusion kind of background. Right, right. So he would gear the program to his sort of went into this jazz fusion, kind of like Eric Klug or whatever mm -hmm. kind of thing. Then, then when I did my poem, then he would come out. It was just masterful how he would do this thing. So I was just fascinated. I would watch him do the board. And eventually a whole crew developed around us. We did our little jingles and these little skits, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm always in crew. Then when I, then when I got, when I went to my, my, um, my final, uh, well, I got kicked out of Bronx Community College for all the takeover that we did. You know? <laughs> but when I came and then went to the Air Force, when I got back out, I went to uh, Livingston mm -hmm. College, part of Rutgers University. And I ended up doing a broadcast program over Rutgers Station, the RSU. Mm -hmm. And that's where I, 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 I well, I, at the time, you had to take this third class license, endorsed third class license, and so I took this test and I passed it, and, and I got uh, I got a program. But instead of just getting me one person in this all white Rutgers campus, I brought my roommate, the biggest blackest <laughs> guy I could find on campus, and my and my confidant Sonny Bryant. So four black people walk into the station when they thought they was getting one. You know? So when and so I trained them. I, mean, I got to tell you. So I trained mm -hmm. them basically because this, this is sort of germane to what I do. Right. I trained them basically. We was, uh, we had one. It was a weekly program. So I had one one week you would be the host of the program. The next week you'd be the producer. The next week you'd be right. the uh, engineer. And then one week you had off because we was in college. But we all showed up. So mm -hmm. I basically trained this group of people to do our program. Coming to BAI, <clears throat> by the time you know people in theater and people in uh, you know writers and they always talk about finding their voice, right? By the time you got to BAI, you had a, a plethora of things under your belt. Yeah. Did you walk in here with a, 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 a voice developed already, your ideology and philosophy already developed, or did you walk in here and have to reassess based on what you saw coming through the BAI portal? Well, that's a, actually, that's a, a magnificent question, because my sewer journey is, is almost like... I realize that I, I, I'm, I reoccur... I mm. do things the same she way. She does my suspicion. All, all the time. But you have to remember, since I was taught, since I was a Negro ensemble coming from 67 to 70, mm -hmm. so I have three years of professional theater training. So when mm -hmm. I got out of the Air Force and went to college, I couldn't take theater. Mm. So I, I actually took communications, but I didn't take radio communications. I was actually good at video. Hi, video people. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and uh, 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 well, well, video and, and uh, a TV. 
for the production. production. I, was really, I was really good at that. But I had my own broadcast program, but I didn't take any radio courses. Mm -hmm. um, so when so when I graduated undergraduate school, it was in it was in communications. Mm -hmm. At the same time, and then I spent uh, about six months, I just wrote, on a whim, I just wrote some plays, because I was thinking of, uh, um, well, I wrote some plays, and then this new, the, 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 the a great, uh, uh, MFA program, Master of Fine Arts program, mm -hmm. in playwriting was happening at the campus over at the Douglas campus, which was, well, the Mason Grove School of the Arts, Douglas is an all-girls school, but they had a you know, thing on the call, the Mason Grove School of the Arts. Mm -hmm. um, and they accept, on the strength of these two plays, I just dashed off. They accepted me into the MFA program. Wow! So I spent I basically spent three years in the MFA program. Did everything, but um, everything but dissertation, mm -hmm. which is the greatest thing that ever happened in my life. Because if I got my master's, I'd be teaching somewhere in some mm. college in the Midwest. You know, uh, but let me let me I just finish the story just for a second. So when I came, when I left that program, you know, everything but dissertation. When I came back to New York, I went back to theater, but it was ten years since I left. And theater, I found very cliquish. Mm -hmm. A lot of nepotism and stuff like that. I joined the attack group for, to try to do technical stuff mm -hmm. for theater because I wasn't into what they was doing. Uh, in fact, I staged, the first thing I did, big gig, was, was stage managing the R&B ensemble with Seiko Sudiata's mm -hmm. first group out of, uh, here in New York. Um, but uh, but I started listening to radio more. I knew about WBAI because one of my teachers in college, mm -hmm. Pepsi Charles, mm -hmm. I had been to the... I had been to the, when BAI was at, was at the famous church on, right, on, on right. 62nd Street, wherever it was, uh, because uh, County Cullens, Willow was there, and I, I, I really loved mm -hmm. County Cullens, and I was there, and, you know, so I knew, knew about mm -hmm. that, but I really didn't listen to BAI in my formative years in New York. But when I, got, uh, when I got back to the city, I just got disillusioned with theater, and I started to listen to more like, you know, RL was... What's mm -hmm. happening? WLIB, you know, with mm -hmm. Pablo Guzman, mm -hmm. who we used to be a well, <laughs> he used to be program director here at one particular point with a, another day of what they call coups. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Gary Bird came yeah. on after him. Mm -hmm. So you know, I was listening to that kind of thing, and then I was listening to BAI, of course. But Bernard had a program that did close to what I was I like. So when they asked for volunteers, naturally mm -hmm. I came in to volunteer for his program mm -hmm. to, to answer phones. So at the end of that thing, I, when he came, he came thanking everybody. And I said, well, well, Mr. White, can I talk to you? He said, oh, Mr. White, this, come on, yeah, we'll talk. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know, I did a little college radio, and I think I can, I think what I can do for your program is do, you know, I noticed your program, and I would really like to do some mm -hmm. box pop, because that's what I, also the things I, right, I like right. to do, just taking people's voices and making a story out of it, mm -hmm. out of what you have without but taking you out of it, you know? And so he said, well, get together something and see what you have. So I went out and, and had my little recorder and came back, put the tape together. And he, listened, and he gave me a tiny criticism. They said, well, this is fine. They said, well, but, you know, this is good that you want to help. You can help with the program, whatever. But what do you want to do? Mm. I said, well, I, I want to do theater and radio. You know, mm. I want to do radio dramas. He said, oh, we do that here, blah, blah, blah. Now, this is like 1982. Mm -hmm. I didn't really officially do my first a real official audio drama, what I call audio drama, radio drama until... Uh, 1987. Now mm. you have to ask yourself, hmm, what were you doing for five years when wow. they said you could do it anytime you wanted to? Well, I noticed this place, and I'm going like, this is really clickish here. <laughs> this is like, oh, this is this is fascinating. I'm looking around, so I ended up basically learning everything I could about the station. When I say the station, not only just the personalities, but the equipment, mm -hmm. and I ended up, you know, just engineering. I just, you know, not my own, right. uh, not right. my own agenda, serving the station, if you will. Still, even I, when I come here now, when I come back to the station now, sometimes the first thing I do, remember to drive, I get on the phones, I right, answer phones, because right, right. that's how I started. I don't, but not know. only that, that those are primary elements within the show. I, I just want to go back to something. It's, it's slightly off the topic, but I'm listening to your history of interaction and activity, and I can find you a thousand young people today who have not even scratched what you have done, and yet they carry this bag of proclamations of what they are and what they can do. And I find this absolutely fascinating, especially when you talk to them and you kind of point out, well, theoretically, yes, I understand what you're saying that you do. But in reality, in practice, like if you're a producer, what have you actually produced? If you're a playwright, what, have you, what play have you actually brought to life? Have you run across this phenomenon where people have especially younger people, have these titles and confidence and attitude, 
but the actual track record of performance and capability are lacking. See, what you, I, I think, I understand what you're saying, and, and, and of course I have to agree with it, and I say of course I have to agree with it because the evidence is there. However, I have to put a, a but in there, there's always a but. Mm -hmm. I see where that's coming from. You know, when I was arts director, I w it was famous for this. People would come to me, oh, man, brother, you know, I got something to say for the revolution, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I said, well, that's nice, but can you edit tape? <clears throat> no, you don't understand, brother. This information has to be, no, no, that's great, but, but can you edit tape? Mm -hmm. So in my department, in the, and they would tell you from, from 1991 to when I left in 1996, if you came to the arts department, you had to know how to edit tape, I would make people, I would force people to engineer. Mm -hmm. I would force them to engineer. Mm -hmm. So it's not the young people's fault that nobody, you know, n nobody made me sit down and watch JB for six and a half hours run his board. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't, I don't mm -hmm. want people to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe they should do that. But that was my own initiative. But the thing is, if I'm a, if I'm going to blame a young person for doing whatever it is, it's only because I didn't put them through their paces. Mm -hmm. I didn't, what they call, mentor them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I didn't, I didn't insist that they cut tape. I didn't insist that you get in that room and edit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. when, 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 look, one of the people on the has been here for a while is, is Jay Smooth. He came to me when he was 16 years old, you know. And so I trained him in radio, made him edit tape. Well, I said, made, him, you know, made him edit tape. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but engineer, when I did my first uh, big live audio dramas, right there, you know, I'm engineering, but I threw him on the board, mm -hmm. made him engineer a live broadcast. Mm -hmm. What, what, what could he do? You know what I mean? He had to do it. This thing is live. Mm -hmm. And ironically, today, Jay Smooth is, uh, this guy is, I was down in Trenton one day, and here comes Jay Smooth on some radio show down there. This guy is everywhere, but it's a direct reflection of what he went through in his training. You know? But that's what I'm trying to say is most, most you know, nobody wants to, you know, but oh, this, this, they need a break, let's give them a break. But they want to give them a real break. Mm -hmm. They don't want to put them through paces. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not, this is not just young people. Mm -hmm. Even, oh, man, I got stories. I got stories. I mean, one time, because one time Alambe, this is so funny, Alambe, <laughs> this is great. I used to engineer for, I used to engineer a lot of people's programs. I used to engineer for Alambe. One time I had to leave and Alambe was coming in I said, Lambe, you have to run your own board. Mm -hmm. I said, Lambe, look, what do you do? You talk on the microphone, you might play, you play a record, mm -hmm. and you might take a phone call. Mm -hmm. This is the switch to do this. This is the switch to do this. This is the switch to do that. And, hit, and I set the levels. I got to go. This is like, mm -hmm. you know, 10 minutes before the program. You're going to do this because I ain't going to be here. And, of course, Lambe did his program, mm -hmm. engineered his own program. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm not trying to make, you know, all I'm trying to say is that you, you, if, you, if, you're, if you're in a situation and it's important to you, then it will be, by definition, it will be important to you. You'll get it done. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm noted for, you know, look, we're, we're in a forgiving medium of, of, of or, well, my medium of audio drama is a very forgiving medium because nobody respects it. You know, I mean, so that's that old time stuff. You know, it's not, we don't have these slick graphics and blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah. But necessity is what it is. I remember when, we, when, 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 when Democracy Now, I was engineering Democracy Now when it got kicked out of the station during the, 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 mm -hmm. the, the infamous coup. And they, they, we were in the firehouse. And so I'm engineering the firehouse. And this is, a, this is a great story. And people think that Democracy Now is this great juggernaut that, you know, somehow we, I don't know, somehow we planned it. Well, we got kicked out of the station. We got kicked off of the airways. I was still doing normal radio, so every once in a while I'd slip a democracy now that we was doing it on the airways, so that got me in trouble. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But what happens, we're in a firehouse just, you know, doing our little thing. And one day, Rick Jurgens from mm -hmm. MN, you know, he comes in the studio and he says, and because we weren't being broadcast on the BAI, I think FMU was taking the, mm -hmm. the, the signal from, from New Jersey, so there's the southern part of Manhattan was getting it, but Manhattan wasn't getting it. So, so Rick said, well, why don't you open the cameras? Mm. And you go like, huh? Well, this is a satellite studio for for M and N. Just open the cameras, and we'll and we'll and we'll, we'll broadcast it. You know, mm. we'll we'll broadcast it on M and N. And we're looking, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at Amy. Amy's looking at me. Go, huh? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, Miranda Kennedy is going like, huh? You know. <laughs>